So I did a video not too long ago featuring a DIY in-flight entertainment system where I actually had a little portable monitor with a Raspberry Pi strapped to it and that was suction mounted to the entertainment screen on the plane seat in front of me and it was a stupid idea. I mean, for all intents and purposes, it was very impractical. It's like, why don't you just get a tablet? Just get a freaking iPad and call it a done deal. I completely agree, 100%. But little did you guys know, that whole project was essentially just preparation for a much bigger project that we're discussing and exploring today, which is essentially taking that same idea of a portable monitor, but replacing the Raspberry Pi with a Windows-based PC, creating multiple instances of that setup, and then essentially trying to run a LAN party 35,000 feet in the air on an airplane. Oh, God, that was like the perfect intro. And then the phone goes off. Good Lord, I hate spam. Ooh, spam sounds really good right now. Sorry. Anyway, this is probably a dumb idea, but it sounded really cool and I'm up for the challenge. You know, it sounds exciting. We're essentially gonna try to do a three person LAN party. Myself, Wifey Sauce, and Chris. We're gonna be on a 13 hour flight to Taipei for Computex 2019, where we'll be doing event coverage. So it seemed like the perfect opportunity to try and pull this off. Now the hardware we chose for this was critical to the mission's success because we're dealing with a confined space with limited power options and a number of other factors that we really had to take into consideration before just picking out parts willy-nilly. So we each have an Intel NUC 8 Performance G mini PC. These things are super powerful for their size. I think I've heard Intel say that they're currently the smallest desktop PCs capable of delivering some decent VR experiences. And it seems like they have the specs to back it up. I mean, we've got an Intel Core i7-8809G, 16 gigs of DDR4 memory, along with the Radeon RX Vega MGH graphics processor. So yes, that is an AMD graphics chip inside of an Intel product. And believe it or not, it pairs very very nicely with the Intel Core i7 chip that's in here. There's also a one terabyte SSD on board and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Wi-Fi, we don't really care about so much for this project, but the Bluetooth is gonna come in handy as you'll see in a moment. Now the AC outlets on our aircraft are specced at 110 volts with a 100 watt peak that our NUCs might exceed under load, but hopefully by down clocking the heck out of our CPU and GPU, we can get these systems juiced up on the plane. This is by far my biggest technical concern of the project. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Now, as far as monitors go, two gamers will be using the same U-Perfect 13.3 inch 1920 by 1080 IPS display that I featured in my in-flight entertainment video because it's a great panel. And if you guys watch my dedicated review on that product, you'll understand why. The main draw here is Thunderbolt 3 support. And since the Intel NUC also supports Thunderbolt 3, we can send power and video to the monitor over a single Thunderbolt 3 cable, making the whole setup a lot cleaner, more seamless. It's gonna be awesome. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to secure a third U-Perfect monitor here in time before our flight, which leaves in two days. So I had to slum it down to an iYoYo monitor, which is a cheap Chinese brand, kind of like U-Perfect actually. But this display gets its power straight from USB. There's no Thunderbolt 3 support, so we have to use a standard HDMI cable uh, to get the job done. A little less graceful, but it should still work out. Now, in order to get these systems connected to each other so we can actually LAN, I picked up a black box 100 megabits per second five port switch. I like the fact that it's pocket sized. It means it's not gonna take up much space. It's good for travel, but more importantly, it's USB power. And since all of our AC outlets will already be occupied by the NUX, we really needed to find a switch with an alternate power source. Plus, I feel like we're gonna incur a little bit less cable clutter this way too. Now, while we're landing it up in the sky, our fingers will be interfacing with the lovely Cooler Master SK621 mechanical keyboard. This is a practically new product from Cooler Master. It's a 60% keyboard with genuine Cherry MX low profile switches. So it's very thin, fits in a backpack easily, uh, but also that 60% 10 keyless design makes it relatively narrow as well, which is perfect for super thin fold out trays on aircraft carriers like the one we'll be on. The cherry on top is that these are Bluetooth supported so we can connect to our NUX wirelessly. That's one less cable we have to worry about. The cherry on top of that cherry, however, is that you can actually charge with a USB type C cable while you're using the keyboard. So you'll essentially never go dark even uh, midway through your flight. And how could you? The, the thing's chock full of RGB lighting, shocker. Now it's also worth noting that we're each bringing our own Bluetooth headsets so that we can hear the in-game audio and even talk to each other on the plane without disturbing passengers around us. The last piece of hardware here is the Logitech G305 gaming mouse. This thing is awesome. I bring it everywhere as the same mouse that I used for my in-flight entertainment video. It is wireless, but I would still use this mouse as a daily. It's super fast, very low latency, and incredibly comfortable. I could keep it in my hand for hours on end. Now then, that's a lot of tech that each of us gamers has to worry about finding a space for at our passenger seat. Of course, we could just throw the NUX on the floor of the plane and prop our monitors up on the little fold-out trays in front of us and call it a day, but there's just a few too many compromises with that idea. 
idea. The first main issue being safety. I mean, if you have nucks on the floor with cables running between them, someone could easily trip and fall. That wouldn't be good. Also, safety of the device itself, something that small could easily be stepped on. And secondly, it's a comfort issue. And this is a bit more subjective, but at least for me, when I'm on a plane, I can't stare at a laptop or a tablet that's on my little fold-out tray for very long without getting a bunch of neck strain because I'm looking downward at such a steep angle because it's so close to me, and uh, it just sucks. It's definitely no way to game on a PC. So because of those various compromises, uh, I want to find a better solution. And, and we have. We're going to emulate the sort of uh, system that we used for the in-flight entertainment setup, uh, which is essentially taking the PC and fixing it somehow to the monitor and then taking that two-piece setup and mounting that to the seat in front of us. The first step was actually super simple because all three of our monitors feature VESA mounting holes and the Intel NUX actually include a VESA mounting bracket. So it was a completely seamless integration that took all of 20 seconds to set up. Securing that bulk of hardware to the seat in front of us wasn't quite as straightforward. We basically had to remove the back plate of the NUC, drill two holes in it before mounting a cheese plate that contained a bunch of quarter inch and three eighths inch holes. Then after reinstalling the back plate, we were able to attach a suction mount to the cheese plate using the suction mount's quarter inch thread. At that point, we basically had a compact DIY all-in-one desktop PC that could be mounted eye level on any plane to any passenger seat in front of you with an entertainment screen. Now bear in mind, this is a fairly heavy chunk of hardware. I mean, with the monitor and the nut combined, we have just shy of three pounds uh, of, of actual weight. And so I actually did a three hour mounting test with our suction mount to ensure that it wouldn't fall down mid flight or anything like that. And it passed with flying colors. There was not an ounce of struggle, uh, no signs of instability. The suction mount actually did a great job. As far as setting up the actual LAN goes, it was pretty much as easy as getting all the PCs connected to the switch and then assigning IP addresses to each system before having the host PC create a LAN match and having the other two systems connect uh, using the host's IP. Uh, but with all that said, uh, in all of my testing, everything ended up working flawlessly after I ironed out all the kinks. Albeit in a controlled environment, here on solid ground. So the big question now is, how did all of this perform 35,000 feet up in the air? I have no idea because I haven't tried it yet. So let's fast travel. I'm gonna fast travel roughly 48 hours into the future to Taiwan so I can tell you all about the experience when I get there. Sound good? All right, I'll see you on the other side. Okay, I'm here in Taiwan on the 14th floor of my Taiwanese hotel balcony, and uh, not so great news. The attempt to do a land party in the air was a complete flop because the outlets on the plane wouldn't actually power the systems on at all. Even though the outlets on the plane were rated for the spec that I thought they would be, 110 volts, 100 watts, the amperage is probably the thing that was holding us back in the end. We all just kind of looked at each other and after having so much hype built up to make this work, it was a very, it was a very discouraging moment. So after several hours of sobbing silently to myself, I finally pulled myself together and thought, okay, we have one last chance to make this work on the way home, albeit we'll be down a gamer because Chris actually has to leave to go back home a day before Wifey Sauce and I do. So at the very best, we can hope for a two-person LAN party. So we put our heads together and thought, okay, maybe we can track down an AC power bank. And we actually happened to find one at the Enerpad store. It was from a brand called Enerpad. The store was located in a local tech shopping center here in Taipei. They actually had three different models available. I was looking at the two larger ones that had much higher milliamp hour ratings, but the store employee assured me that those would not be allowed on any Taiwanese airlines. So I ended up going with the smaller one, the 40K model, which is 40,200 milliamps, 120 volt output with 100 watt continuous output and 120 watt peak. Brought the battery back home, plugged the NUC into it, and by golly, it booted. We got into Windows 10 just fine, and we celebrated, we laughed, we cried. But then once we tried launching CSGO and we were just about to get into the match for the first time, uh, the battery died. And uh, clearly we went over the 120 watt peak limitation that the battery had and it completely died, killed off the NUC and everything, and so we were very sad once again. Then I remember that the NUC can be overclocked, which means it can also be underclocked. So I immediately plugged the NUC into the wall, jumped into the BIOS, downclocked our Core i7 to 2500 megahertz on all cores, then jumped back into Windows so I could get into AMD Wattman, and then downclocked the uh, RX Vega graphics by 43%, and that took our core clock down to around two to 300 megahertz under load. Powered the NUC down, plugged it back into the AC power bank, booted, and then upon the second attempt to launch into CSGO, 
we were in. Uh, and we were still getting well over 100 FPS in game because CSGO isn't very demanding. In fact, we were able to game for a good hour, maybe just under an hour before the battery finally died. So it's not great for longevity purposes if you're actually trying to game for more than an hour. But for the purpose of this video and uh, just to show proof of performance that a LAN party can be done on a plane, this was definitely good enough for our needs. So we immediately went back to the store to buy a second AC battery bank for Wifey Sauce's system. And that brings us to present time where we are here now, at least in the context of this video. Now our flight home doesn't leave for another two days and I don't wanna wait that long. So I'm gonna fast travel into the future once more in a last ditch effort to make this now two person LAN party in the sky a living reality. And please, by the might of the PC gods, let this work. Okay, here we go guys, wish us luck. All right. We're back in LA. Hey, I'm getting really good at snapping. Thanos would be proud. So by golly, we did it. We actually got the LAN party working on the way home. It is amazing how we were able to pull this off. Now I have to apologize right up front here that the B-roll footage that we got on the plane isn't the best because there was slight to heavy turbulence at times and the cabin lights were either dim or off during the entire time we were filming. So sorry about that, picture quality's not the best, but still very excited with the end result. As expected, the battery packs gave us just under an hour of continuous gaming, although we discovered that the plane outlets actually had no issues recharging them. So we could have technically had multiple hour long gaming sessions on the flight with a couple hours of charging time in between. Our keyboard and mice fit perfectly on the fold-up tables, and apart from a few brief moments of heavy turbulence that would rattle the monitors and throw off our mouse aim, the experience was comfortable enough that if we had continuous power from the plane outlets, we could have easily played during the entire flight. Rest assured, I'm already thinking of ways to make our next airborne land party attempt more streamlined in every way. And finally, winding down here, some of you guys might be wondering, does this break the current world record for highest elevated land party previously set by myself, Paul, and a bunch of other tech YouTubers several years ago at the peak of Mount Elbert in Colorado, some 14,000 feet above sea level. I don't know. You know, it was never really a goal or intent of this project to break any records, but I would kind of say yes and no. You know, technically it's a land party that we hosted at over twice the elevation, but it's also relying on an aircraft to get us off solid ground. So it's sort of in its own ballpark. To be honest, it doesn't really make a difference to me. I just figured it was worth addressing because people are probably gonna bring it up anyway. And it's an interesting topic for discussion if you guys wanna share your thoughts on it down below. But I think that's it. That's pretty much it. This has been a LAN party on a friggin' plane, guys. Thank you so much for joining us on this wild ride. I already know there's gonna be a part two follow-up where we try this again at some point, and knowing what we know now, I think round two is gonna be exceptionally awesome. So thanks for sticking around for that. Guys, toss a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Get subscribed for more tech stuff coming at you really soon, and I will see you all in the next video.